Genesis chapter 11. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. These are the generations of Shem. Shem was a hundred years old and begat Arphaxad two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he begat Arphaxad five hundred years and begat sons and daughters. And Arphaxad lived five and thirty years and begat Selah. And Arphaxad lived after he begat Selah four hundred and three years and begat sons and daughters. And Selah lived thirty years and begat Eber. And Selah lived after he begat Eber four hundred and three years and begat sons and daughters. And Eber lived 430 years and begat Peleg, and Eber lived after he begat Peleg 430 years and begat sons and daughters. And Peleg lived 30 years and begat Reu, and Peleg lived after he begat Reu 209 years and begat sons and daughters. And Reu lived 2 and 30 years and begat Shurik. And Reu lived after he begat Shurig 207 years and begat sons and daughters. And Shurig lived 30 years and begat Nahor. And Shurig lived after he begat Nahor 200 years and begat sons and daughters. And Nahor lived 9 and 20 years and begat Terah. And Nahor lived after he begat Terah 119 years and begat sons and daughters. And Terah lived 70 years and begat Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity, and Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took them wives, and the name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife Milcah, and the daughter of Haran, and the father of Milcah, the father of Ishaka. But Sarah was barren and had no child. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, and his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, and his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan and they came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were two hundred and five years, and Terah died in Haran. I call this chapter, The Lord Confounds Babel and Confirms a Man. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, I thank you for this day. I thank the blessings you've given to us, Lord. Thank you for Genesis chapter 11. Help us to understand uh, what you would have us to do as a people. Help us to understand your commands that you gave Noah and his sons to see where they were confounded, and yet you confirmed Abram. Lord, I just pray that you'll help us us to gain wisdom from this passage. Help us to always walk in your light and just now pray. Amen. We see in verse 1, the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. You know, obviously coming from one family, you're not going to have one son going around, hey, I think I'll make up the Chinese language. I'm going to be Chinese. Go out east right now. You know, Shem, he's going to go out east and become Chinese. And then you're going to have Japheth automatically go, oh, I'm going to be German. I'm going to go learn the German language. You're not going to have that. You're going to have one family. You're going to have one language and one purpose. Now in Genesis chapter 9, we we have the command of God to go forth and multiply. And he gives the command to the animals. He gives the command to all things to go forth and multiply and replenish the face of the earth. But yet we see here in this chapter, the whole earth was of one language and one speech. And they all migrated to the land of Shinar, as we see in verse 2. Shinar is the region, you remember Ur of the Chaldees is south and Babylon is further north where they found that country a little later. And Babel is probably a little south where Babylon would be as the later town would be up north called Babylon. Babylon, but the Babel probably further south where all of them are congregated and dispersed from. So a bit more closer to the 
Euphrates and where it comes out to that river or, or that lake. But basically, they're all gathered there in the plain of Shinar in a flat plain, not up in the mountains. They moved from the mountains of Ararat towards going east towards the land of Shinar. So they gather together and in verse 3 we see it says, Go to... Let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And it also says they had slime for mortar. So we see here that they, rather than dispersing, they made a comment. Previous chapter, we learned about Nimrod. Nimrod means rebellion. And uh, he was the start of the city of Babel, and his, his nation was called Babel. He started that gathering together. And then in Genesis chapter 11 here, we see that they say, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And then they also say, say in verse 4, go to, let us build a city. And so we see here that most likely Nimrod is the one leading this thing because in the previous chapter he says that Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord. He rebelled before the Lord and basically he led them into a way that says, hey, instead of going out like the Lord told us to disperse among the whole world to replenish it, go to, let us go and build a city, build a tower and use these things. And it says, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And so this is their purpose. Rather than dispersing, they want to do the opposite. They're rebelling. Rebellion is the turning of saying, oh, I know this way. And they turn and say, no, we're going to do the exact opposite. They knew this is within a generation or two of the ark landing and then starting to disperse. And they said, go to, before we get dispersed, we're going to gather together and not be dispersed. It says in verse 4, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And so this is the exact opposite of what they were supposed to do. And so we see here that the, the, the people that did the exact opposite of what they were supposed to do was they built a city. Now was building the city and uh, the tower probably what caused this? No, it was probably because of their heart. Their heart was to do the exact opposite of what the Lord told them to do. And so we see here the whole people to prevent the will of the Lord gathered together built a city and that was the first nation on the earth through the power of Nimrod so Nimrod being the mighty hunter before the Lord you know how the Bible says follow me and I'll make you fishers of men here Nimrod is saying follow me and I'll make you a gatherer of people. He hunted after people in the exact rebellion of the Lord. And so he's rebelling against the Lord. He's gathering people together to build a tower. So the Lord says, be dispersed, uh, replenish the earth. But he says, let's not replenish the earth. Let's gather together and build a tower, lest we be scattered upon the face of the earth. So a tower whose top may reach unto the heaven. And so here's the purpose is they're supposed to be down here on earth, but yet they're going to gather together. Together to try to reach a tower unto heaven. Now, obviously, we know that you can't build a tower high enough to go to heaven, and they're building this tower in a plain. Why didn't they build the tower in a nearby high mountain or something that they wanted it to actually get higher? So there's questions there, but that's really immaterial. But some people theorize that maybe it was to be a watchtower, kind of like, you know, how you have an observatory, you get a big tower there, and you, you watch the heavens. Because the plane, when you get into a plane you don't have necessarily mountains in the way of the sky you have a long plane basically with the slope of the earth the mountains kind of milled away in the background and so you have this plane in the middle of nowhere uh, with a large tower because they don't want any obstructions from the heavens and so they want to build a tower up into the heavens the common theory is to watch out for a, another anomaly maybe like asteroids or something that caused the first flood or they're looking for a naturalistic explanation for the next disaster to come about. Obviously, the Lord is what brought the first flood and caused it to happen, but what they're doing is building a tower to the heavens and looking out for perhaps astronomical anomaly. Hey, maybe it was an asteroid, and so we're going to look out for asteroids. We're not going to do what the Lord tells us to do. We're going to come together and build a tower. Uh, the same word here for slime is that pitchy stuff, that stuff that is very sticky, probably like what they did with the Ark of Bulrushes with Moses was they pitched it in and out with, with pitch. Here they had pitch for mortar. And, and when they look at Babylonian construction, they say that this stuff was very,
very waterproof. And so they're, here they're building a large tower, almost like an artificial mountain, in order to observe the skies and to be waterproof. So perhaps Nimrod, knowing that he's in rebellion to the Lord, wants to build a tower for himself that is secure, that can't be overflowed with water and can be watertight. But that's only a theory. We don't know exactly what happened here, but that's the gathering idea. Because if you want to do the opposite of what the Lord is, wouldn't you, as a rebellious person, try to do the opposite of protecting yourself from a flood? You know, the Lord says, hey, I'm going to no longer bring a flood upon the earth. That's what the rainbow is all about. But yet he says, I don't believe you, God, because I'm in rebellion to you and you and I hate you because you tortured and killed people or whatever. I'm going to build a tower in rebellion to you. I'm going to make it waterproof and you're not going to knock it over. And civilization is going to endure regardless of what you believe or what your command us to do. And we see here in verse 5 through 9 that God scatters them all over the face of the earth. In verse 5 it says, And the Lord came down to city, the city, and the tower, which the children of men build. And so we have children of men that are building the tower. They're in rebellion against God. And they are children of men. We remember before the flood that there were children of men, children of God. And the children of men did their own things, what was pleasing in their own sight. And the children of God, originally calling upon the name of the Lord and seeking to do his will, eventually saw the daughters of men and were corrupted. And then all men fell away after their generations. So those children of God died or whatever, and then they moved on, just became one nation of wicked men seeking to do their own pleasure. And so here we see the same thing happening. You have the Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth who were righteous in the sight of God, who were preserved from the flood, and then they were carried over from the flood and were, were preserved, and then they were given the command to go forth and multiply. And so that's what they did. They had children, and they went forth and multiplied. But we see here the opposite it is happening and no longer are they following after the Lord but they are called the children of men once again. No longer are these people serving the Lord, but they're in rebellion to him. They're children of men. They are doing wickedness, the exact opposite of what God asked for them to do. The children of men will always try to do the opposite of what the Lord commands. And the Lord came down to see the children, the city and the tower. Uh, the personal character of this indicates that this is probably an, uh, the representation of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, whenever the Bible talks about the Lord, typically the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes down and appears before men that's typically a pre-manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ and so this is before he's in the body of Jesus Christ he's the word of the Lord he comes down and, and oftentimes in other passages when he comes to prophets he'll say and the word of the Lord came into the prophets of Jesus Christ talking directly to the prophets in the first part of Genesis you'll see that the Lord is speaking to John through his angel that he gives revelation to and so we see Jesus Christ often doing this with the Gospels, the Gospels of Jesus Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Revelation. These are Gospels and, and things given through the angel to the people, to the apostle. So we see here that the theophanies of Jesus Christ, we believe it to be, it is God and coming down to see. And we know that Jesus Christ is God. Here we believe it to be the word of God coming down to see what the children of men build it. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they are all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. These men, they are desiring to do this in rebellion, and if we leave them alone, if I let this continue out, you know, a lot of times we see how the Lord allows things to continue out. But here is a specific thing. He knew that if he allowed them to do this rebellion, then they won't be dispersed upon the whole face of the earth. They'll be in one nation. You know, they, they say the whole population of the current earth is about 7 billion or so, and it can fit comfortably in the state of Texas. So if you have people that are in one location, very tightly building towers, you know, skyscrapers everywhere, you can fit a bunch of people. Have one big city and then a bunch of farms that get all their food or produce flown in, and you can have one giant city and and that's kind of what would have happened here is that they would all stay in the land of Shinar and the whole world even up to billions of people would not be dispersed and so he says if I don't do anything now then nothing will be restrained from this nothing here is not like like they're gonna sprout wings and fly that type of thing what they're talking about here is that their rebellion will have full force their rebellion will have nobody opposing them. Seth still righteous still living at the time had no ability to defeat Nimrod today we have people like Hitler and things that say go to let's build a great empire or, or, or something but yet you have righteous people opposing him and he's overthrown 
Here you have people not able to overthrow him because early on in their generations and the righteous people are not there to be able to do the Lord's will. And he says, these people, these, these children of men, I'm going to disperse them and I'm going to confound them. I'm going to confuse their cause because their one cause is to gather together and be in rebellion to the Lord. But he says, I'm going to confuse their cause. I'm going to confuse their language. I'm going to confuse their one mind and cause them to leave and gather together themselves. But I want to point out here, it says in verse 3 and 4, the men say, go to, let us build the tower, the city, and so forth, and gather together lest we be scattered upon the face of the earth. But we also see in verse 7 here, God himself says, go to. God's go one go to is a lot greater than man's two go-tos. But we see here that the Lord also says, go to. Let us go down and there confound their language. So they are saying, the men are saying, let us as one people go down and confound their language. And then God's saying, let us go down and confound their language. And so it's kind of play on words there, is that the men as one people, as one nation, uh, want to do something in rebellion to God. But then God himself, being a trinity, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father says, let us. You know, they have one mind, one purpose as well. So it's it's a comparison between the, the children of men here and the Godhead saying whose go-to is going to win. It is going to be God's all the time. When you say in rebellion to God, I know you sent your son to die for me. I know that you made a way of salvation for me till that I may be restored to you. Even though my sins are as scarlet, if I come back to you and be washed in the blood of Christ, they'll be made of snow. I'm going to be in rebellion to you, Lord, and I'm going to do the exact opposite of what you wish me to do, which is not serve you. I'm going to go do my own thing. I'm going to go to with other people and do rebellion against you, and I'm going to reject you. And then he's going to say, go to, I'm going to cast you into hell fire. He's going to, he says that you're condemned already. And so we see here that if you rebel against the Lord, he's going to do something against you. We see that throughout all of history. Sometimes he allows it to have its full force, but we also must realize that we cannot rebel against the Lord and have no consequences against it. So verse 6, uh, verse 7 here, he says, Go to, let us go down and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So here is he's confounding the language of all the people. The division of the languages is, is very interesting. Modern linguists know that man did not invent language. They say it all came from one mother language, one mother tongue. Even in secular studies, they can see where all the language of all the earth came from one mother tongue. And there are sounds that human beings can make if it was an evolutionary process where we started with grunts, ooh, ah, ee, ah, you know, just like the caveman sounds, you know, you see on TV. Uh, oh, the caveman wants to go, oh, 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 come, I'm going to get you, oh. You know, and then they develop from rudimentary grunts or something. Now, the linguists admit that there is only one language that was most likely fully formed. You know, obviously, they're not going to have words like computer and telegraph, modern compilations. But what they're going to have is a fully thought out system. Where does the verb go? Where does the noun go? And, and these fully thought out forms. And the linguists cannot bring it further past the mother language, breaking it all down. So language cannot be a product of man putting together sounds by himself otherwise you would have a language somewhere to say i want cheesecake the <laughs> but uh, there are certain sounds that we can do like the raspberry you know <laughs> that it's not a word anywhere in anybody's language that people have naturally coming to them that they like to make but is not part of a language and if it was evolutionary process it would be but it's not Verse 9, from thence did the Lord scatter them broad upon the face of the earth. Now, he confused their language, and because of the confusion of language, what happened? When you think of other nations and things, you know, you think Chinese people, oh, they're communists, oh, I, I want to stay away from them, uh, I don't know what they're saying, I, I don't understand their speech. Well, what happened? Remember what happened when they got off the ark, when God gave the permission to eat meat, uh, and the animals had the fear of man on them, and they feared man? Here's what's happening now, a similar form, is in their 
confusion of languages, now each other fears each other because I can't understand what you're thinking. Maybe you want to maybe you want to destroy the construction of this tower. Maybe I'm the foreman on the site and you're building a six inch wall, but I want it to be a 12 inch wall and, and you keep on insisting it's your way and I keep on saying, you got to build that wall six inches. Oh, six inches is this, right? No, six inches is this. Their languages, you know, people are confused in their words and, and, and then confounds them. So what happened here is not just merely that they stopped understanding each other, that God gave them complete language. Remember, Adam had a fully formed language. He was able to name all the animals. So what happened here is all of a sudden, you got one guy speaking a language and you got another guy speaking language. They both think they're idiots because the day before they were speaking the same language and now they all think everybody's being a jerk about it and they go home for some reason. Maybe their family's speaking the same language and so they go off in families. I'm going to build my own tower. I'm going to go build my own civilization. And so they were confounded. The day of Pentecost, the opposite happened. When the Spirit of the Lord comes down, what happens? You have 120 people speaking all the languages of the world. They're speaking one language, and yet many languages are coming out. The Holy Ghost working through them is speaking the language of the heart of the people that hear it, that they all heard it in their own language. They were like, what is this? And the people were confounded. We have here where God switches their language because they're not doing the will of the Lord. Then they get confounded by God by the dispersion of their languages. They're no longer one language. But then as a miracle of the Lord, as a gift from the Lord, he gives the utterance of tongues at Pentecost. And then all these people that were confounded in their language back at the Tower of Babel now can hear the gospel with a pure heart, with hearing the gospel. And from there, they spread it forth all over the world. But at first, before they were saved from the gospel, what was it? They were confounded. They were confused. They were bewildered at the fact that these people, being Hebrews, are speaking many different languages. One guy is speaking Syriac. The other guy is speaking Babylonian. The other guy is speaking Ethiopian and so forth. And, and these people, proselyte Jews, coming there to be part of the ceremonies, took the message out with them. And so we see here that when the Lord comes down to do his will, people get saved. But then when they go down, go to, to do their will, people get dispersed and confounded and confused. When people are lost, there's conflict. There's things that are in between them. But when they come to the Lord, they then get restored that one spirit, that one mind, that one goal to spread the gospel around the world. In Jerusalem, they were getting people saved and they were gathering together and they were clumping together as naturally people do. They were clumping together and having one big church, thousands of people in one big church. But the Lord brought persecution to spread that church abroad in a way to confound the church so that he would bring the message throughout the world so that they would replenish the earth. We as children of God replenish the earth. We're salt and light to the earth to bring his gospel. And so the same command that he gave to Ham, Sham, and Japheth and Noah, the same command he gives us as Christians dispersed among the whole world, the gospel. And so we see those parallels in the start of the church as well. We see from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon all the face of the earth. Now the whole account of what happened at Babel is anti-God, dictator, organizes a rebellion against God and his direct distrust of God's promise shows man hasn't gotten any better since the flood. Now man has time, progress, government, organization, and have made man better off economically perhaps, but man's time, progress, government, and organization have all led men away from God when we are not salt and light in the world. So those things don't make people better off spiritually, they just make them better off financially and eventually they become corrupted they become evil and then our government becomes an evil dictator rather than the restrainer of evil that's supposed to be so we see here the first part of the chapter the confounding of the people and a lot of these chapters are they're a combination of one and another thing symbolizing two different things here we have the confounding of a whole group of people but then a confirming of one man who follows the lord verse 10 through 25 we get a lineage of shem talking about the generation of Shem that the Lord works through. These people the Lord will work through eventually bring forth his son Jesus Christ. But first he brings forth a man named Abram. At the very end of this verse 25, and Nahor lived after he begat Terah 100 and verse 26, Terah lived 70 years and begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now even though Genesis is a big book, about 50 chapters, most of this book is about the man Abram that God calls out becomes Abraham. Verse 27 says, Terah begot Abram. Abram is unique in the way he is called the 
friend of God. In James chapter 2, verse 23, he's called the friend of God. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and was called the friend of God. And then in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 7, it says, Abraham was a friend of God forever. Art thou not our God, who didst drive out the nation, the inhabitants of this land, before the people of Israel, and gave it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend, forever? Not temporarily, but forever. And then also we have Abraham, my friend, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, he says, But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. So the whole nation of Israel was become a nation because of Abraham, God's friend. Now we too, through faith, are Abraham's children. And we need to realize that much of what we have here in the Bible is because of the faith of Abraham. And so we need to realize that here's the start of God's people. He confounds Babel. He rejects all those people, but he finds a man who, who's righteous and following his will. Just like he found Noah, also found Abram to continue out his will on the earth. We know the value of having friends in high places. Now, uh, Abram had a friend in the highest place, but there was an Abraham Lincoln, uh, an interesting story about him, received a request for a pardon from a man who deserted the army. And when he was told that the man had no friends, Lincoln said, I'll be his friend, and he pardoned him. Sometimes it's always good to have friends that are in high places. And if you are a child of Abraham, if you are a child of faith, then you'll be a friend of God. And when you are a friend of God, great things will happen for you because we are his friend. And so we see here men and women in the Bible are famous for many different things, but Abram is great in his faith. Now Moses was a great lawgiver. Joshua was a great general. David was a great king. Elijah was a great prophet. Most of us know that we can never become great in those things, but we can be people of faith. We can be great in our faith. We can be friends with God. And the greatest thing that the Lord Jesus Christ did for us was make a way back to the Lord so that we can be a friend of God. But if you despair in knowing that you have not have Abram's faith, take comfort in knowing that you have Abraham's God. He can build you in the faith of Abraham because he had built in Abraham himself the faith to follow him. So we see that God confirms not only because Abram was following him, but before Abraham was following. The Bible says that be, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And while Abram was yet in wickedness, God called him out of idolatry. We see that in Joshua chapter 24, verse 2, it says, And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. The Bible says that they had served other gods. In chapter 2, it says, Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, into the land that I will show thee. And so God had called Abram. And what made Abraham a friend of God? was that he had faith and followed God. He followed him out of the land of idolatry and said, only you will I follow. I'll follow you to where you call me to go. That's what salvation essentially is, is that when God is calling you, he's calling every one of us while we are yet in our sins, and he's saying, will you follow me? I have made a way through the blood of Jesus Christ to remove the sins from your life, and will you follow me? And then if you say, yes, I'll follow you, and you commit your heart to him and say, I want to be restored back to you, and I will do your will, Lord, then he will make it possible for you to do his will, to follow him. You will have faith. He'll grow faith in you. He'll take you while you are a sinner. He'll wash you of your sin, and he will grow faith and love for the Lord in him. Just like he did with Noah, and like he did with Abram, like we did with most everybody in the faith. In the Old Testament here, we see that the Lord took them when they were nothing and brought them up. So verse 31 says, They went forth with them from the earth of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And so he followed the Lord. Abraham's family came from a family of idol worshippers, and later Abraham's grandson Jacob went back to Abraham's relatives. And what were they doing? Were they serving the Lord? No. When Jacob went back to them, they were still worshiping idols. They had household gods. It had gotten worse. And so even though a lot of times people will call us from a family, he'll call one son, but then sometimes the family will stay there. And then sometimes you'll have to be divided from them. he have to be called out of it. But then we see a sad state of affairs in one part is verse 31, basically, was that he had been called out of the land of the Chaldees and to follow the Lord. 
And But then here's the mistake. He went forth with Terah out of the land. Terah led them out of the land. Oh, okay, Abram, this is what the Lord's calling you to do, to leave the land and go to the land of Canaan. Well, it says, verse 31, they went forth with them from the earth of Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. So that was the goal. Terah says, okay, I'll lead the family, the whole family out. You know, I'll follow your faith, Abram. But in verse 31, it says, and they came unto Haran and dwelt there. Sometimes we hear the word of the Lord. And we say, hey, we're going to do the word of the Lord. But then other people that don't want to go as far as we want to go, we, we want to go all the way to the land of Canaan, but they say, oh, we'll go with you to Canaan, but they only go to Haran. They only go halfway. They don't go all the way. It's okay to go to church. It's okay to have a form of religion in your life. That's not a problem. We'll go ahead and go with you. But to actually talk to other people about the Lord, to actually buy and sell and, and get gain in the world for the Lord's kingdom? No, I'm not going to do that. To become a missionary to deepest, darkest Africa or Asia or to, to some country in the foreign lands that the gospel has been lost to them because of their previous wickedness? No, I'm not going to do that. That'll harm my flesh. And so they'll only go halfway. They'll only go a little way. They won't go farther. In verse 31, it says, They came into Haran and dwelt there. Acts chapter 7, verse 2 through 4, make it clear that the call of Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, came to Abraham while he still lived in the earth of Chaldees. When he received the call from God, he was only partially obedient because he took his father Terah with him to Haran, even though the Lord called him from Ur by himself. Sometimes it's better to go by yourself someplace than it is with a bunch of people who don't want to do the will of the Lord. Acts chapter 7, verse 24 says, says, And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in the Charon, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans, and dwelt in Charon. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed himself into the land wherein ye now dwell. And so Terah died in the land of Haran, in verse 32. And then Abram moved on and did the will of the Lord completely. Sometimes there are people that will hold you back. Not that they're hateful or bad people, but it's just that they don't want to do the will of the Lord for your life. And they'll hold you back. The name Terah means delay. He brought him halfway. He said, I'll take you to Canaan, but he brought him halfway to Haran. And the name Haran means parched, barren, or barren. And so a lot of times when you don't do the full will of the Lord, you won't fully receive the blessings of the Lord. And a lot of times when people only go to salvation and no further, they will say, well, I'm not seeing the blessings of God in my life. Well, it's because you didn't go further into the will of the Lord. You didn't do those good works that he called you to. The name Herod means parched or barren. Basically, is that when you are in that state, you're saved from hell, but your blessings, your spirit doesn't grow. It's parched, it's barren, it's not complete. When Abraham was in partial obedience, then delay and barren Barrenness characterized his life. Now, he had no children. He had nothing of his own. It was all Terah's. Everything belonged to Terah, and he was part of his family. When we delay in drawing close to God, we also experience barrenness in our life. Not only is it as a lost person, if you haven't called upon the name of the Lord, that you need to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. That's the most important thing because it will save your soul from hell. But as a Christian who has already called upon the name of the Lord, uh, is already saved, what you need to do now is not to be barren, not just going halfway, but fully commit yourself to the will of the Lord in your life. And then it is only after you fully commit yourself to the will of the Lord, fully go into Canaan, that you'll have a child, that you'll amass wealth, that you will amass things for the kingdom of God. And uh, the, the question is here also that people have brought up is that if Abram had gone to Canaan right away, instead of stopping at Haran, gone by himself with Sarai, his wife, and went to Canaan, then he would have gone in a time of prosperity and blessing. But then the problem is the delay in Haran caused him to arrive in Canaan, not when it was a time of bounty and blessing, but when a time of a famine was upon the land. So if he had gone when God had told him to, then he would have been able to amass something for his family to live on and stay in the land of Canaan. What happened when he went to the land of Canaan, didn't quite get himself established. He had to go down to the land of Egypt, which is a symbol in the Bible always of the world. He had to rely upon the gains of the world to sustain him through the famine in the place he was supposed to be. There are a lot of different ramifications and what ifs, but it's better to follow the Lord after a time of hesitancy than it is not to follow the Lord at all. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the blessings you've given to us, Lord. I just pray that continue to speak through your word. Help us to not be in rebellion like the land of Babel. 
not to be confounded in the world, but to be confirmed by you in salvation, and not only just be confirmed by you in salvation, but to do your will fully at the time that you ask us to do it, and that we may see your blessings and your full glorious will in our life done right away, rather than so much delay and sorrow and heartache that sometimes happens when we don't fully trust and follow you. Lord, I just pray that you'll continue to guide our hearts, help us in your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.